So I'm going to talk to you about one of the case studies I've been working on in the context of my research, uh, which is titled Towards an Early Warning System for Leptospirosis Paralysis in Northeastern Argentina. To begin with, uh, buttons, yeah. To begin with, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the background of leptospirosis. It's, um, many of you probably are public health agents, so you know about that. But maybe as a refresher, leptospirosis is caused by a bacteria um, called leptospira. Uh, it typically presents as a febrile syndrome, so that makes it a little bit difficult to be diagnosed and many times confused with dengue and other um, similar syndromes. And it affects annually 1.03 million people um, with a case fatality ratio of 7%, which roughly translates into 58,000 deaths uh, per year. It is typically considered to be a zoonosis. And although livestock, dogs, and many other mammals are able to carry the bacteria, rodents are known to be the main reservoir. And the way that these rodents um, end up communicating the bacteria to people is through multiple transmission pathways. Um, we can identify uh, recreational pathways, occupational exposure, uh, and also associated with extreme weather events. And in the context of this study, I'm gonna focus mostly on the occupational side and the extreme weather events. So um, to understand how people end up getting infected and also to understand why leptospirosis is climate sensitive, we need to go a little bit up in the system and understand how the climate pattern is influenced in South America, particularly by one of the main forces, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a couple, um, a couple ocean atmosphere pattern, which is characterized by presenting um, two distinct phases. We call them El Nino and La Nina. And they tend to have influences on the amount of precipitation in specific areas and also in the temperature. Um, as I said, there are two main type of phases and um, the most important one or the one that we are mostly interested here in this case study is El Nino, which um, it is not homogeneous all across South America. Um, we're gonna see, for example, that in Northeastern Brazil, it creates droughts, but in places like Peru, we're going to have um, big flooding events and sudden increases in precipitation. Um, and that's where particularly where this case study is located in northeastern Argentina. So, um, yeah, just to uh, this is just as a representation matter here, you can see that during an El Nino event, the sea surface temperature at the Pacific Ocean um, increases. It has positive anomalies and that leads to an increase in precipitation and flooding events. So when these conditions change, we have an increase in the level of exposure. And that happens because we have animal hosts um, who are carriers releasing bacteria in the water. And then that leads into environment and contamination and people get exposed. In addition to the other risk factors that are already put in place, like for example, occupational exposure and recreational, although in the case of uh, a flooding event, uh, that is very unlikely. Um, and when infections occur, most of the infections are going to be asymptomatic, but in um, 10 to 30 percent of the infections, uh, they are going to become symptomatic with the typical febrile syndrome that I was uh, mentioning earlier. And 10 percent of these symptomatic cases are going to become severe, requiring hospitalization, and that can lead to potential death through uh, kidney failure or uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. The thing is that when we're working with surveillance data, the only cases that are captured are the symptomatic cases and those that require hospitalization. And in the context of Argentina, this is captured by the um, national surveillance system um, managed by the Ministerio de Salud, uh, that would be the health ministry, and is regularly published in the form of bulletins. So in this context, what um, we were trying to do is to first characterize the effect of hydrometeorological variables on leptospirosis cases in um, Santa Fe and Entre Rios and uh, two provinces in northeastern Argentina, and also to evaluate these potential candidate models in their predictive performance to start setting up a potential climate-based early warning system. So we worked with surveillance data for these two provinces. This is made up of um, confirmed cases and we can see the distinct outbreak pattern here. Um, it's normally made up of irregular outbreaks. So we see a big one in two, 2010, 
2015 and 2016, but it's pretty much, we have these outbreaks all across the time series. And also you can see here that between the two provinces, there is a big river, which is called the Paraná River. And it's also um, a main, um, it's, a, it's associated with big flooding events. So we incorporated that um, their monthly values together with monthly precipitation values and also uh, the Nino index 3.4, um, which is, as Emily already mentioned before, um, the sea surface temperature anomalies in the Pacific Ocean um, region 3.4. So what we did is basically assume that case counts had a negative binomial distribution and we develop a model in which the log of the risk follows uh, this linear predictor I'm showing here which is, uh, first of all, defined um, by the, the annual population size, which we included as an offset, in which makes this uh, model um, able to estimate the risk. Uh, a set of combination of uh, climate hydrometeorological predictors. And um, not only we use the monthly values, but we also included lags from zero to five, because um, we didn't only assume that the impact of, um, of a specific um, amount of precipitation would rely only on this particular month, um, but we also assume that it could have a delayed impact up to five months. And also uh, we included uh, temporal random effects. We included seasonal random effects, which is represented here by Delta uh, with the function random walk two and annual random effects, um, which we extracted from an IID distribution. Basically these temporal random effects assume um, are able to come into place to replace all those variables that we weren't able to manage or we weren't able to measure in these two provinces. And that is um, one of the strengths of this methodology because normally when we're working with surveillance data, we don't have access to this uh, information or to the entire information about the system. One last thing that I'd like to mention here is that we follow um, a modeling framework of increasing complexity. So we started by an intercept only or non-informative model. We moved to a random effects only model. And then because ENSO uh, modifies the patterns in precipitation and river height, we modeled ENSO models or the, ENSO, the effects of ENSO on one hand, and then separately the local climate. Um, that's why we have a set of ENSO models and local models. So to show you first here the results, uh, this is basically to show how well the model fit. Um, unfortunately, I, I underestimated how big the screen might be, but um, you have in gray line the observed number of cases, and then in colored line, you're gonna have the fitted values with a 95% credible interval. And you can see that it actually follows the time series quite well. And um, that tells us that the model fit is quite good. And also tells us that we can interpret now the effect sizes of the different hydrometeorological variables. And we see there is a positive effect of all the variables we included. And none of them included the new value. Um, so that means that in a frequencies approach, we would assume this is significant. So then we uh, proceeded to run out of sample predictions by leaving different bits of the time series out of the training data set. And this uh, first plot you can see in the Y axis is the number of counts. And then in the X axis, you're gonna see the years. I mean, it's a monthly count. And you can see that the predictive values are actually following quite well the um, observed number of cases. And uh, we also model the, the first model you see here is the random effects only model, which is a model we chose as a reference um, because there's absolutely no uh, model right now for um, a learning warning system. So the current practice is, okay, so we know that the rainy season is coming. I know that we know that the high temperatures are coming. So we would expect more cases uh, when the leptospirosis season system begins. And you can see here, uh, looking at this value, the CRPSS, this is a relative measure compared to a reference model that tells us how much better uh, does the model uh, compared to this reference. So you can see that in Enterrios, particularly, um, the ENSO model with a two month lag had uh, an almost 40% increase in predictive ability compared to the reference model. And the local climate model had a 29% increase in uh, compared to the reference model. Unfortunately, we did not see such a strong improvement for Santa Fe that might be associated with uh, the lack of information we had, for example, about other water bodies that are flowing across the province. But when we evaluated the ability of the models to detect the outbreaks, we noticed that the ENSO models 
were very good at um, had a very high hit rate. That is, um, it predicted very well the number of outbreaks. But then the local climate model with a one month lag um, had the ability to reduce the false alarm rate. So this allowed us to suggest probably that a two-stage uh, two stagger, uh, stagger approach might be useful for a potential early warning system in Navis in Argentina. So this is an example of how this two-stage stagger approach might work. This is um, calculating the outbreak probability for March 2010. We had a first prediction done with um, in Nino index 3.4 in December 20, 2009. And we see that the outbreak probability is uh, 84%. And then a second stage prediction with local climate in February 2010 gave us an outbreak probability of 80, I'm sorry, I can see the number, 89%. So um, if I was a public health official, I would be deploying intervention strategies to prevent these outbreaks from happening. For example, uh, one way of doing that is by deploying um, pre-exposure prophylaxis or identifying population at risk, like for example, people living in slums or close to uh, flood prone areas. So uh, some closing remarks. Leptos one of the really positive things about lepto leptospirosis is that it is so climate sensitive that it has very promising potential for a climate-based early warning system in Addis in Argentina. Um, of course, now the next steps could be to assess the role, I mean, how useful would be to use predict um, forecasts of the predictors so that could possibly increase the lead time until the outbreak occurs. Um, this is another example as, as what Raquel, Rachel, and Emily have already shown today, but how climate services can be tailored for public health purposes. And then last but not least, in the context of a, a global change, um, we need to keep developing these prediction tools in order to protect people because these vulnerable populations are becoming more and more at risk. So thank you very much.